Welcome back. So, in this video, I'm going to be continuing on with a guide through our studio. In this case, I'm focusing on the right side of my screen, which could have been rearranged if you played with the panes feature. However, I'm going to be talking about the environment, history, connections, tutorial, files, plots, packages, and help primarily. So with that, let's talk. So the, the main idea for this environment pane is that it allows you to visualize the objects that you've created in R. That's its primary purpose. So for example, previously I ran a um, function that allowed the creation of numbers which was a object containing a bunch of randomly generated numbers. I also sourced a file, a separate script file, using the source function, which caused it to run that file, which created the function ABBA. So you can see that they have a little short description. It tells you their name. That's cool. I'm going to delete them, though. So I'm going to focus on a few different objects. So to do that, I'm going to create the object's uh, character vector example, or cod vec x. Sounds like I'm speaking Klingon. Uh, and it's going to contain some characters. And uh, right now I just got an error. And let's check out that error. It is saying that it expected a token something, and there's a syntax error. The reason why is because I've left it in shell mode. So I know in this last, that last video, I did talk about how you can change the language, and that's going to be a common issue as we do start to use both languages. But for now, I want it to interpret this code as an R script. So if I try that again, you'll notice instead of going to the terminal, it went to the console, because the console is how RStudio communicates with R. When it did that, it didn't print off anything. It just sent the line of code to R, and nothing else happened. And that's because we took that data. This, uh, this is a combined function. And we combined the letters A, a string of letters called hello, uh, from, and me, exclamation point, and stuck them together into a, um, a series of characters or strings, uh, which we would call a vector. So in R, even a length one object is considered a vector. Uh, it's more about what's inside. So in this case, it's a bunch of characters, so it's a character vector. That's really more than you need to know. What's important is that it gives us information over this environment pane. You'll notice it says CHR, that stands for character vector. And, and then it gives us a quick little summary of what's inside. Now, if it was a little bit longer, so let's add one more. Um, piece of text to this, you'll notice it just has dot, dot, dot. So it, it can only visualize up to so long, just for the record. Number vector, or num vec x, it's really fun to say. It does the same thing. Uh, I, I made it a little bit fun. Here is just the number 10, so a length one number vector. Here is a function, technically, using this colon, what we call an operator. I'm sorry, there's so much vocabulary. There is a section on operators, though, if you're unfamiliar with any of these background functions. But I've taken this colon, and it, that is actually one through five, each of the whole numbers between those values. And so if I look at that, that's what's popped up over here. That means that numvecx, the object, contains those numbers. And you'll, you'll see it even tells us it is a number. Cool, it's a numeric vector is how we would refer to that. Uh, this next one creates a matrix, and this is where it gets a little bit fun, is a matrix is like a, a rectangular set of data. It's got rows and columns. I'm not going to go into the syntax here, but um, in this case, it created a character matrix, and I can view that matrix, which is pretty cool. If I click on it, and that doesn't happen if I click on here. You'll notice my cursor changes to a, a, a finger or a hand, uh, but it doesn't here. When I click on it, it actually pops up a view of this matrix. And this is really cool, but there, there are a few caveats. This view, well, first of all, what's interesting is RStudio isn't doing it. RStudio sent a command to R that says view this object. It's right there. So I didn't manually type that. If I wanted to, I could actually add that to my script. 
And so if I'm going through and I'm like, yeah, character vector, number vector, character matrix example. Oh man, let's look at that character matrix example. And I run that line of code, it pops up. And for the record, I was just pressing control enter each of those times with my cursor on the line, just reiterating that really useful interaction tip. So that allows us to view our data. It can even do like some sorting and some like basic analyses. I don't think you can edit in place. Yeah, you can't edit, but it, it's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, it can visualize even extremely large data sets um, at maybe some non-insignificant computational cost, but it can do it. Um, so a really handy tool that's also accessible through this environment pane. So I'm just gonna quickly go through these these create a data frame object and a list object. And we're gonna have like a whole, like whole lectures based on objects themselves. And there's pages on the canvas that help you understand what is the, the concept behind these objects. But um, what's cool is data frames and lists are both stored a little bit differently than vectors and matrices. Uh, they are stored as what we call a list in terms of memory. And this means that they have sections. So this list actually has four sections, which I guess I can talk about the code briefly. It has this first section, which is the first argument. Here's the second argument. Here's the third, it's unnamed. And here is the fourth, it's also unnamed. And so if I go to my view mode, I can actually see this information. Here is that first object. It's just the uh, character uh, vector example. Uh, here is the second object. It is a data frame. So it is this data frame example. Uh, here is the, oh, this, sorry, this is the character vector example, and this is the numeric vector example. And so I can't visualize these very easily, but I can explore this data frame. And that's because lists and data frames it kind of go hand in hand. It, it's a complicated system, but essentially data frames are stored as lists and that's really all I'm gonna talk about for now. But the nice thing is it means that they can be explored in a similar way. And so I can expand them within here. I can even visualize like how to extract them. So that's actually what this button is appearing right here. So if I click on that, it actually tells me how to extract that particular part of the list, which is a really handy tool. And if you're watching this video, that probably just gave you some really good ideas on how to solve homework uh, in my class. <laughs> so good job. <laughs> All right, so that's the environment pane's like basic utility. That's how most of you are going to use it. It is, however, much more powerful than that. It doesn't just allow you to explore the stuff you've made. It allows you to explore like all the other packages that R uses, including like the base R package, because there are objects that you can't see. So for example, pi. Pi 3.141593. I don't actually know how far out R considers that or if that's just the default number of values to print. I know it's not, I've checked that before. It's much longer, but. Um, I can just type that in. And so I didn't tell R what pi was, it just has that stored. Additionally, I can print stuff. Well, print is a function, and that is technically a type of object, as I can see if I do any sort of custom function. When I do that, it loads in as a new object called h, which is now just the function called uh, h that prints off hello. So it, it's all in there somewhere. And so where is it? Well, what we've been currently looking at, at least when you load up R by default, is the global environment. This is basically everything that is kind of at a top level. Um, I say that because as you learn about what we call scoping, um, and R, it means that stuff that is lower than it, so they're kind of nested, um, it can actually find information within that global environment. And that's really, I'm gonna talk about scope here, but I did wanna at least point out that if you're ever unsure of where some object is coming from or if it exists already in the loaded packages, you can actually go through and explore the packages that have been already loaded by R. So by default, R load stats, graphics, graphic devices, utils, data sets, methods, and base. 
And so a lot of the functions I talk about in this class are mostly base level functions. I, I try to stick with the essentials, the stuff that everyone can use. And so I can see, you know, there are some default vectors. Here's lowercase letters. Here's uppercase letters. I, in fact, I used letters right there. Letters, I, I, I was tricky. Letters is just all the letters A through Z in lowercase. Letters, I shouted, sorry, sound people. Uh, letters is all the capital letters. Um, and there's other things. There's pi, you can see it is actually extended out to additional values. And finally, here is all those functions that are in base R. And so print is in here. Several versions of print, in fact, uh, are in here. And so that's what's kind of going on behind the scenes. So you don't have to load these. They're all loaded by default. But if you did load a new package, it would appear here and you could go and explore it within the environment. So uh, import data sets is a really powerful tool. I don't really use it that much because I learned R Studio before they implemented this feature at its kind of current level. Um, but it's really powerful and we're gonna create a whole video just for that um, and how to import data into R. But the general concept is you can click on it, you can select files to download. So here's that file I created earlier. I can say, use the first column for the row names, use the separator is a comma, it's a comma separated value. It even gives me like a preview. Uh, really, really powerful tool. I almost always click strings as factors to be false. I do not like factor objects. More about that later. And I can import it. And what's fun is it, again, it creates the code for you. And this can be a really cool tool for learning something that's very challenging. Importing data is a very challenging thing to do. And so it, it's helped you write that code. And so you can learn from that. You can see that, all right, if I wanted to use the first column as the row name, I just, it will build that for me. And now I know, all right, to do that, I use the row.names argument. And so when I said, I learned this kind of the hard way, um, that I had to learn to use that argument, things like that. So really cool, powerful tool. Um, this talks about how much memory it's using. Uh, it's just kind of handy to keep track of. This button will clear all objects from your workspace. Thankfully, it, it does allow you to confirm that, so you're not gonna accidentally click it too easily, but that is going to remove all of your current uh, environment's um, objects. So I don't want to do that. Um, you can list it in different ways, which causes it to sort. And generally, it's going to refresh. Uh, I have run into a couple of instances where it wasn't refreshing correctly, but that's not very typical. And finally, that you can save the entire environment. So tutorial on environment, mint. <laughs> Tutorial on environments, not a tutorial on spelling. And I believe it will save it. Uh, it, the, the, it doesn't matter really what your ending is. I like r.image. And that's just because the function that it actually calls is called save.image. And what's cool is whenever you do that, and I say I did want to restart my environment. Let me just copy and paste this to store my code because I'm demonstrating good coding practices. So that's what I did. And now if I want to load that information, I'm just gonna cheat and copy paste here. It's not cheating, it's being good programmer. Um, I can use this load function, which will load all of the information stored in there. Really nice handy way, especially when you're doing stuff you're not really comfortable with or you're confused what its outcome will be or you're worried it'll crash your computer, which is normally my issue because I work with pretty big data sets. So that's the environment pane, very cool. Uh, anything else? Yeah, you can search for things using this. That's most of this uh, pane. History is what it sounds like. It's just a list of the history uh, of commands that you've done. So you can scroll through here and, oh, there's some of my research. Connections is not something you're going to encounter too often in this class, um, if ever. 
uh, but or really at least to need to go use this connect this connections tab. But essentially, like there are some very clever ways that you can interact with files on your computer that are valuable and maybe even necessary when working with extremely large files. Uh, it, it's their methods of connecting to the file and then like sending data into it, like just append this to the end or change this one part of it without having to load the entire object or the entire file into memory, which on a computer where you have limited memory, it can be extremely valuable. Um, so I don't, I don't have any connections made right now. It's unlikely that you're going to really need to use this in the class. Uh, probably the more common thing is if you accidentally connect to um, a file uh, during some of our like sequencing analyses. But in those cases, we'll come back to this step and, and, and tell, tell you more about it. And finally, the tutorial, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into this much, uh, but it contains tutorials, unsurprisingly. And so if you just wanna do some independent practice, uh, I've heard excellent things about this learner package. Uh, Shiny is really cool, and like if you are gung-ho about this concept, like please look into it and submit me some Shiny apps that do the same analyses, I would just, it would make my day. Um, but Shiny apps are these things that allow you to do interactive scripting and, and like kind of publishable uh, web pages that allow you to interact and explore data sets. It's very fun. I, I use them actually in my research. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the environment pane. So for this bottom section is uh, the one that I probably use the most. I don't typically browse my environments or things uh, in that way, I usually use things like codes, like ls function. So I put that over here in the source pane. That allows me just to kind of print off what's in my environment very quickly. And I can do like code on that list of objects and search through it. And that's just because I tend to use a lot of code and I have a lot of objects established. Um, there are a few things that I could show you that I guess I should mentioned before moving on to files, you can remove objects from the uh, environment. I showed you how to use this little broom, but another line of code that is just code based is this right here. This says remove, and then it, you give it a list of, um, actually a vector of characters that are equivalent to the names of these objects, and it will remove those. So currently I have a nested function. It calls ls, which is all of the names of my things, and then it removes them. So I say be careful with this because it will remove all of your things. In this case, no permission was requested. So definitely something to keep in mind. I'm gonna put those apostrophes on there just to be safe, and I'm gonna reload my image. And there you go, there's some of the beautiful beauties of that load um, of an image file. Okay, so now let's go on to the files uh, pane. So uh, I'll start from left to right. The files pane is uh, extremely useful. It is a, a view of your current, uh, of actually a directory on your system. This can be manipulated. So right now it is my working directory and that's because uh, in the previous video I changed my working directory. Uh, by default, your working directory uh, can be established by set wd, and your home directory is where it will most likely be on your computer right now. And so that is, uh, the, there's a symbol that stands for it called a tilde. For a Windows systems, that tilde is the um, documents file by default. And if, uh, to demonstrate this files pane though, if I click on this sprocket, you'll see that there's a bunch of things. And like I said, I can't go into everything. But if I want to go to my working directory, I can scroll down and go to either set as my working directory, which would send uh, text to the console and the console would then run it and it would change the working directory to the downloads file, which is where the files pane currently is. If I click go to working directory, it will change this view to the downloads file, or sorry, change uh, this files pane to my working directory, which is my documents. Uh, 
So I can try to browse to downloads. Let's see, it's a little bit tricky to do if it's not inside of your um, inside of your working directory. So I'm just going to set my working directory the way I showed you in the previous video. I've changed my working directory. Notice again, it injected code uh, itself to change my working directory to the downloads file. Um, yeah, and that's, that's how we can change our working directory from here. Uh, synchronize working directory. I don't actually know what that one does. I'll have to look into that. Uh, you can also open a terminal location. So that changed where my terminal was located. I'm going to close that one. Um, and I can do some basic file manipulation. I can rename files. I can delete. I can move files. I can even launch from here. So for example, if I wanted to view a piece of code that has saved a file, I could do that. So let's, let's create a file and demonstrate that behavior. So in this case, um, I've using this R norm, so you'll notice this is looking a lot like that code you saw in the previous video. Um, but here, it, it's all kind of nested within each other. So this creates normally distributed data, then it plots a histogram with a lot of breakpoints. So that's the second argument. Go learn about uh, arguments to learn why that's set up that way. So if I just run that line of code, you'll notice it goes to the plots uh, section of RStudio. And, and that's really a demonstration of how we can use the plots window. The cool thing is it will also automatically update and redraw most images if you click and drag the borders. And that can be really useful for trying to kind of get the right aspect ratio for your graph or uh, make it wide enough to fit this really long kind of bad uh, title. Um, those can all be very valuable. Uh, you can zoom it. I don't really typically use that too much. You can export it from here. And so if I do that, you notice that one does not inject code into the console. And what that means is when it did that, it didn't do it through R. It did it through R Studio. And that can have some pluses and minuses. Like part of the goal of learning R and learning like this way of interacting with data is that it's replicatable. And if you're over here clicking and dragging to make your aspect ratio change, that's not very replicatable code. It, and I would say that's kind of bad practice. It means that if someone is trying to create that same view, they're checking their work, like you guys are checking your work and you are going through and it's not matching up with mine, you may not know why if I use that method. And so what I generally do is I use R to communicate with um, the file and produce that file all by itself. And so there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, this I'm not going to have time to go through all of these settings, but essentially, instead of just calling this hist program by itself, this hist function, I first call this p and g function. And the difference is, is this plot is just that pop-up. From the very beginning of the last video, there was a pop-up that appeared. And that was like created by R. That's what we call the graphics device. And so here, instead of going to the default graphics device, which in our studio is this pane, I'm saying that the graphics device will be a PNG file. It's a type of image file with the following settings, a specific height, a specific width, uh, and a unit to that, as well as a resolution, dots per inch. So if I run that, nothing happens. And that's because what just occurred, and you just couldn't see it, is that it created an empty file. So there you go. It's a hist example.png with zero bytes. Now, that might actually be in the connections. It's not. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, that's why I don't use connections very often. Uh, and then I'm going to fill that empty file with this plot. Oh, I guess I clicked away and that caused an issue. Um, so then whenever I click dev off, one second, let me just repeat that. This is actually a good chance to demonstrate that uh, it's oftentimes a little bit confusing what data is going where. So I'm going to keep pressing dev.off until it tells me that there is no graphics device, that it's, it's not communicating with any particular device. 
There we go. So now it's telling me cannot shut it down. There is no more devices to shut down. So I'm going to rerun that real quick. PNG, hist, dev.off. So notice when I ran hist that time, it didn't appear in the plots. And that's because that data got sent to the file. And that's how I knew last time. I was like, oh, something went wrong when I clicked on the connections tab. Um, but that's the goal is you want that data to go to a file. And now if I actually navigate to that <coughs> and I click on hist example dot uh, PNG, I did refresh just to be sure. Notice it has data in it now. It's 30 kilobytes. And so if I click on that, there we go. We now have a histogram and I can change how that histogram looks. I can replicate its um, properties so I can make it like a much wider plot. Well, let's make it crazy wide. So it says increased its size and now it's an extremely wide plot. And that's the plots function. It's very handy. So um, plots will store the graphics data unless you're sending that data to a file. And that's kind of the tricky thing to understand. Packages has a list of packages that are installed on your computer. These are different, um, different ways of interacting with R, and sometimes they even incorporate multiple computing languages. Again, a very uh, handy tool um, if you're not sure what's currently installed or you're just trying to understand your computer better. Uh, there is a method of installing from here. However, I will show you in a different video ways to install that are a little bit more typical interactions. Uh, you can also do updates from here. So you'll notice that I have two packages that currently need updating. I could update them, but I don't need to do that on this video. Again, it's not a tab I use a lot. It's, uh, I, I'm usually just trying to load packages, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And then I install it if I need to. But it can be helpful for debugging or troubleshooting. So finally, and I'm not really going to go through viewer or pre presentation because it's not going to come up too often in this class, if ever. Uh, the help pane is tremendously valuable. Please give me one sec. Um, sorry. And uh, so the help pane is a tremendously valuable tool. It allows us to easily uh, view information about different functions or even concepts in R. So for example, there are two main ways that I like to interact with the help pane. So the first one is the question mark. So I will type in code. I'll be like, all right, um, how does hist work? So I've been using this hist function. And if I type in hist with a question mark before it and no other kind of adornments to that code, it pops up the information um, for the manual on hist, which I can go through. I can read. Oh, that is new in the current version of our studio. Oh, look at that beautiful formatting over here. That's really fun. Sorry, I'm just excited. I just installed the new version. It breaks down the, the help file into different sections. We're going to learn more about help files explicitly, um, and there is going to be a section on the Canvas page uh, for it eventually. Um, but the help files are extremely important to learn because most of doing this type of work is just learning. You're just learning new things constantly. It makes it really fun and very exciting. Um, but this is part of that. Um, so it, it also allows you to kind of browse different help files. So I just scrolled all the way down to the bottom until it said index, and here's all the help files for the graphics package, which is where hist is located. Uh, there are a few other features that I want to demonstrate. I can use this question question mark, two question marks next to each other. And that actually allows us to do like a keyword search, like you're in Google. It's not like as powerful and it's not going to pop up the same kind of like um, search parameters as it would, but it will search through and try to find instances of those letters across different functions. In this case, I just typed in the letters L and S. So that's going to pop up a lot of things. And so that's maybe not always what you really want to be using, but it can be quite powerful when you're using things that are a little bit more specific. So like hist. Well, there's that's a much more restricted space to search for, but you can see there is no H-I-S-T in this name. It's in the description. So it searches both. And that's kind of where it gets a little bit tricky. 
Um, finally, there are uh, function versions of those commands. So the help is equivalent to the question mark. However, the nice thing is when you're using the, um, the, the, the function form of help, you can specify other arguments. So here I've said try all packages. And that's going to include even those that are not currently loaded. And so that can be really nice if you're not really sure where a function should be coming from. Uh, in this case, I don't think this actually pops up anything interesting. Yeah, it just ends up being at list anyways. Um, but that can be useful if you're not sure where your object is. Uh, so that is the help file. Um, again, more information on that later, but uh, that's going to conclude our this video. Hopefully you feel better about like interacting with RStudio. I do want to keep encouraging you to just experiment. That's the beauty of RStudio. It allows students and researchers and experienced professionals to interact with the code in such a way that it makes it very easy to learn. It's partly why I emphasize it so much in this class is it's not specifically the R of it all that I want you to know. It's the concepts. It's how to do these type of interactions. So thank you for your time and um, have a good day.